All right, we're in video five on the Mormon Truth video library series on the Joseph Jackson investigation in Nauvoo. He kind of went undercover, as we've said. He found out about the Danites, the Council of Fifty, and the spiritual wife system. The spiritual wife system makes whatever the church is taught about Mormon polygamy looked like the kiddie pool at the Olympics. It was nasty, it was wicked, and girls were trapped by design. That was in really detailed by Joseph Jackson in the last video, number four of this series. So let's move along. And we're actually kind of still in that whole business at this time. Go to the channel button next to the subscribe to get more videos. We've got lots of them. We've made over 70 at this by this time. So there's a lot that, that you can see there on LDS history and changing doctrines and scriptures and see if they see if they uh, contradict each other or not, huh? As we start our Joseph Jackson testimony, we'll notice that Joseph Smith here is dressed appropriately for his role. He's back in black. Okay, so continuing. Being once successful, he held the fear of exposure over her as a rod to prevent rebellion from his allegiance. When as happened in the case of Miss Martha Brotherton and Miss Nancy Rigdon, his overtures were rejected with disdain and exposure threatened he would set at set a hundred at, set a hundred hellhounds on them to destroy their reputations. That seems to corroborate what Sister Pratt said and what Sister uh, Rigdon said. This was a specimen of the mode and manner of Joe in carrying his vile measures of seduction. To the truth of what I have here said. There are hundreds who can testify, and I have no doubt would do it if they can or could be protected from the revenge of the hellish clan which still exists in Nauvoo. The extent to which this abomination was carried may be imagined from the fact that Joe Smith boasted to me that he, in this manner, from the commencement of his career, had seduced 400 women. But to return to the bogus establishment, meaning, conf, conf, uh, meaning uh, counterfeit money. The first attempts at bogus making were rather rough, but in October, Mr. Barton and Eaton came on from Buffalo, having been sent by one of Joe's emissaries, and brought with them a splendid press and all the necessary tools and materials for operation. The press was put up in the southeast room upstairs of the house formerly occupied by Joe, being the same room where the Holy Order had previously met. The business was then rushed ahead in good earnest and an excellent specimen of base coin produced. Soon the city was flooded with this money and a report was put in circulation that bogus manufacturers were at work in the city. Joe had given out that the room occupied by the press was rented to Messrs. Barton and Eaton who were mechanics and were making drafts for the machinery of a factory which they contemplated erecting. The press continued to run until they had manufactured about $350,000. The intention was to keep the press running and purchase a large amount of stock, but being forced to move it by a circumstance which I shall presently relate, Joe concluded to wait until spring when the large emigration which was expected would afford a better chance to operate. About half of the money manufactured was put in circulation in Hancock County and the balance sent east or passed off to transient persons. All of the twelve apostles except Orson Pratt and Eber, he thinks it's Eber, C. Kimball, were engaged in this business and frequently visited the room where the press was and took turns in working it. Hiram, at the time the press was in operation, had a lame knee and could not get out of the whole house but Joe and myself frequently visited him and discussed measures for raising the wind to purchase more stock. Joe told me that in Ohio 
he, Dr. Boynton, Lyman White, Oliver Cowdery, and Hiram were engaged with others in a bogus establishment on Licking Creek, but that their operations were cut short by the bursting of the Kirtland Bank. While the press was suspended in its operations, a man by the name of Brown came to Nauvoo and sold to Joe a quantity of counterfeit $10 Yates County bills for $20 per hundred. Joe and Hiram have been frequently seen with their hands full of these bills by many persons in Nauvoo, and by them the whole county was flooded. There's not a merchant in the city but knows this fact, and also that there has been a large quantity of bogus in circulation. The first who detected the counterfeit paper money were Halperidge Gilman and Company of the New York store. The large amounts of spurious money afloat caused a great excitement in the city, and it became a common talk amongst the most wealthy class, who were not afraid to speak their minds. The agitation of the subject very much offended his holiness, and he, to save himself, railed out in his characteristic style, and pronounced all the curses of God on the heads of these persons who were in fact the most substantial men in the city, such as the two laws. Dr. Foster, F. M. Foster, C. I. Higby, and Mr. Cole. These men he accused of being guilty of all kinds of crime, especially of counterfeiting. This was all done to kill their influence, and in the hope that by raising the cry of stop thief he would turn suspicion from himself. I have stated above that the bogus press was in operation in Joe's old house. At, the, at that time I had laid my plans to give word to Harmon T. Wilson and urge him to bring a posse down suddenly on the city and surprise the apostles at work at the bogus press. But about this time, Avery was kidnapped by a party from Missouri, aided by some citizens of Illinois and carried into Missouri. And now, Avery, no, I was thinking of Avery, wasn't I? This Avery was one of the gang of Mormon horse thieves that infest the whole country. Joe was exceedingly indignant at this summary mode of proceeding against one of his friends, and arrests were determined on. Accordingly, writs were got out, and one man by the name of Elliot, giving in green, giving, living in Green Plains, was taken and brought to the city, charged with being a kidnapper. This proceeding aroused the whole country, and a report was spread in the city that the Missourians and the people of Warsaw and Green Plains were coming to rescue Elliot. Joe became greatly alarmed and removed the bogus press. In consequence of that, this alarm, the city council was called and raised a city police of 40 horse and 40 footmen in the pay of the city, which was placed under the sole direction of Joe and sworn to execute his orders. This police was kept in pay for several days and disbanded to be called out at any time occasion required. At this time, I was forced into an adventure which was near ending tragically. Information was obtained by Joe that a man by the name of Richardson, who lived about nine miles back from Montrose, Iowa, was going to Missouri to testify against Avery, who was shortly to have his trial. He and a boy named Childs were the material witnesses to prove his guilt, and Joe determined to secure them. Accordingly, Joe selected several of his Danite band and placed Captain Dunham at the head, and to try me, ordered that I should go along. I did not know at the time what was in the wind, and I consented. The company consisted of Dunham, Cahoon, Hosea Stout, and Brother W. Kearns, Scoville, Smoot, and myself, making seven of us. We went to the river, and while passing over, the real object of the adventure was disclosed by the answer of Captain Dunham to Hosea Stout, who asked what the prophet's orders were. Now, I read elsewhere, Hosea Stout was one of the high-ranking Danites, and William Smith, Joseph's brother, accused him of being part of, uh, of, of poisoning uh, their other brother, was it Don Carlos or Samuel Smith or whoever it was, after Joseph and Hiram were killed, so as to not have him in line for the presidency and clear the way for Brigham. And that's what William Smith said and some of the others in Smith's family, I think. Joseph's family. Okay, Dunham replied that they were to take Richardson and bring him to him, Dunham, if they could do it alive. If not, 
just kill him, and bury him in a dark ravine, at the same time telling Stout to take good care and have it all done correct. He then gave Stout the command, and pronounced the blessings of God upon us all, and ordered Stout that if any man disobeyed or attempted to turn back out, that they should not let him turn around more than once before they shot him. For, said he, dead men tell no tales. Thinks I, this is a terrible scrape I have gotten into. I am paying too dearly for my sights, for I assure the reader that I felt horrified at the idea of such proceedings, but there was no alternative. I must go and obey or be shot. So I put on a straight face, and determined to go to it, but at all hazards to suffer no injury to Richardson or the boy. We all mounted our horses, leaving Dunham and Cahoon to guard the boat, and rode off at a round gallop. We kept our pace until we got four miles back of Montrose, where we halted at a house and got drink. This was about two o'clock at night. The man of the house got up and went along with us to show us the way. His name was is Hunter, and he is one of the faithful. We again mounted our horses and rode off rapidly. Little was said the rest of the journey. When we got within about eighty rods of the house, the party stopped and commenced talking very low. Being in the rear, I did not hear what was going on, but on riding up, they raised their voices and Stout addressed me, saying that this is Richardson, that this Richardson was a member of their band in Missouri. What band? said I. The Danite band, replied Stout. This was the first time I had ever heard the Danite band spoken of by the Mormons. They had generally called themselves the High Police in the conversation that had had with them. He said, This man is a desperate character, and he knows all of us, and therefore it will not be safe for any of us to go into the house. He don't know you, and therefore you must go in, and we will wait about ten rods off to be on hand in case of difficulty. I declined going alone, but he spoke fiercely. You know my orders. I made no reply for some rods, being on walk, when some of the company who were near said, Is he going? I replied, Yes. Amen, they all cried. We rode near the house and stopped, and I dismounted. Walked up to the door, knocked. Come in, cried Richardson. I entered. When his aged mother who lay in a bed on the opposite side of the room, sprung up in haste and asked me if I was not General Rich. I replied that I was not. Then said she, Ain't you from Nauvoo? No, said I. She then said that these men were such a pack of liars, there was no trust in them. Said I, What is the matter? Again she asked if I was not from Nauvoo. No, said I, I never, I never was there. I'm in pursuit of a horse thief from Burlington. By this time Richardson was partially dressed, and I asked him if I could stay all night, to which he replied in the affirmative. I then asked him if he would go with me to put my, up my horse. He said yes, and drew on his boots, and got a light prepared. While this was going on, 